In the last chapter, what we did was we studied quadratics, that ax squared plus bx plus c, and we learned how to factor them, we learned how to solve them as an equation, and then we learned how to do uh, word problems with them. We're going to mimic that exact same idea, but in this chapter, they're called rational functions. Rational, the root word being ratio. So basically, everything that we saw in the last chapter, we're going to see, but we're going to see it in a numerator and a denominator. So like, just real quickly, if you look at these, see how like they're over each other. They're a different function, so they're going to have a different graph. So remember our quadratic had a parabola. They would have a different graph. We don't really study it a whole lot. Um, but let's read some of the things that it says. It says, a rational expression is just a fraction or a quotient. And it will be undefined if the denominator is equal to zero. So we don't want our denominator to equal zero. Okay, so remember when it comes to fractions, like you never have, want the denominator to be zero, you never want to divide by zero, all, all that stuff. That's kind of the same thing here. Another little reminder, guys, is when you have a negative, that negative can be in front of the fraction, on top, or on bottom, but they're all the same. Okay, and notice it's just one negative. It just doesn't matter where the negative goes. Typically, I don't try to do this because... Remember when we get into adding and subtracting fractions, we need common denominators. If you throw a negative in there, it just makes things more complicated. So a lot of times I'll keep the negative out in front or just on the top and not worry about it on the, the bottom. Okay? So what is the domain? This is a new definition and honestly I think it's one of the tougher things to understand in this class. Even as a student, I had a trouble with it. The domain of a rational function are all the allowable values of the variable the values of the variable that will ensure the function is defined. So basically, what you can plug in for x. We never had to talk about a domain before because it was a quadratic and we could just plug in any value for x and go on our way. The reason why we have to be a little bit of, um, have a little bit of hesitation in this chapter is that when we get here, there's certain values of x that when we plug it in, it makes the denominator zero, which is not good, okay? So this little note right here says for rational f f functions, we are concerned about the denominator being zero. Okay, we don't want that denominator to be zero. All right, so anytime they ask for domain, you're really just focusing on that denominator. So look at the first example, it says, the domain of f of x equals x squared plus 2 over x minus 3. What we don't want to happen is we don't want the bottom to be 0. So what they do is they take it and they set it to 0, but they kind of use the not equal symbol, just saying, okay, I want to see what makes it 0, but I want to say, don't be this. You just solve it like we would. How would you solve for x? You would add 3 over, okay? So that's why they said x can't be 3. So basically your domain in that problem is any number you can plug in, but 3. Because if you plug 3 in, what happens on the bottom? You have 3 minus 3 or 0. Okay? So how we write the domain, you can write, this is a really weird notation, guys. It's a squiggly bracket. It says x such that x is a real number, but x is not equal to 3. You also can do um, this interval notation. You can go negative infinity to 3. And then this union symbol, we'll write it down and I'll kind of tell you what it all means. This union symbol and then 3 to infinity. So basically, the whole number line is fine, except for the number 3, okay? So how would you show the whole number line? You would just say negative infinity to positive infinity, but this way says negative infinity up to 3, and then, th you know, 3 and on. Like, don't include 3. That's why we have a parenthesis there. This union symbol, guys, is just like a plus sign for sets. So, you know, 3 plus 3, you can add numbers. Well, that's a union. That's just plus for this set of numbers plus this set of numbers. All right? So let's look at these. I, again, I think domain is a hard part. I really do. I struggle with it. So if you're still not too sure, let me know. So on these three, they want us to find the domain of each rational function. So we don't want the denominator to be zero. Denominator cannot equal zero. Anytime you see the word domain, think denominator. We don't care about the top at all. All right? So looking at the first function, what is the denominator of the first function? Two. Two. And won't it always be two? Like there's no x down there, right? It is two. So can that denominator ever be zero? No. So since two won't be zero, right? It can't be zero. 
then your denominator, or your domain, excuse me, is all real numbers. How we show that is we do squiggly bracket x such that, so that vertical line means such that, x such that x is real, and that's it. There's no but it's not equal to this. x such that x is real. Another way to show it is with interval notation, basically the whole number line. What I'm going to write or negative infinity to infinity. Okay? Do you have to write both ways? No. Just kind of pick the way you like the best and stick with it. So like on a quiz, I'll just say write it in set notation or interval notation and you choose which way you like it. All right, what's the domain of this guy? Could this denominator potentially be zero if we plug a value in for x? Yes, so let's see what happens. So we don't want x minus 1 to equal zero, right? We don't want that denominator to equal zero. So just solve this, even though it's a not equal symbol, solve it like an equation. So how would you get x by itself? Add one over to the other side, right? You'd add one to both sides. So this would be x cannot equal 1. All right? What does that mean? It means x can be any number, but if you plug in 1, what would happen? 1 minus 1 would be 0, and you have a denominator equal to 0. So how do we write this as a domain? We say x such that x is real, and x does not equal 1. All right? So x such that x is real, and x does not equal 1. Every other x is okay. Negative 2, negative 53, I don't care. I can plug in any positive or negative number except for 1. How would we show it with interval notation? You start with negative infinity and ask yourself, can you do the whole number line? No. You can run the whole number line and then you have to step over the number 1. So how do you write that? You say, take negative infinity all the way, all the way up to 1, but then step over 1. So basically that just shows you the number line, but there would be a gap at 1. 0.999 is okay, 1.111 is okay, um, but the number 1 is not okay. Alright, last one, again, notice we don't care about the top at all, guys, we just care about those denominators. So we don't want x squared minus 2x minus 15 to equal 0. And this is what we did in our last chapter. You guys actually just solved that on your quiz. I have your quizzes. I'll hand this back. Um, how do we solve a quadratic equal to zero? We factor. Okay. If it's three terms, we would just use the AC method. All right. So what would the AC method be? Factors of negative 15 that add up to negative 2. I'm just going to quickly do it. Um, this is something where if you want to have like a separate piece of paper to show where we do it. But factors of negative 15 that add up to negative 2 are negative 5 and positive 3. So this factors to x minus 5, x plus 3 can't equal 0. And then do you remember what we did after we had it in factored form to solve for x? What do we need to do next, guys? Uh, add the 5. Right. We'll look at each of them individually. So um, x cannot equal positive 5 because we'd have to add the 5 or negative 3. Is that okay? So if it asks you for domain, you can't leave it like that because domain are the allowable numbers, like what's okay to plug in. So really your domain is every number but these two. And how would you write it? You would say squiggly bracket x such that x is real and x does not equal 5 or negative 3. x such that x is real, it's a real number, and that's something I could have, why are we writing that? Because there's actually a whole other different set of numbers called complex numbers, um, so these are real numbers, but x can't be 5 or 3. How do you write it in interval notation? It's kind of awkward and it gets long, but basically you do the whole number line like we do here, but there would be two spots where you'd have to like jump over numbers, okay? So I'm going to start kind of far over here. We go to negative infinity and we'd walk the number line. Negative 100, negative 50, negative 3. And at negative 3 we'd have to stop. And we'd have to walk over negative 3. And we want to keep going on to positive infinity, but who do we have to jump over next? 5, okay? So you stop at your first hole, negative 3, 
and then you keep going until your next hole, which was five, and then you step over five. So this would be five to positive infinity. And I know it looks kind of weird, but think of it as a number line. Basically, as a number line, you'd have the whole number line, but at negative three, you'd have a hole, and at positive five, you'd have a hole. And that's what we're trying to show. We would shade the whole number line except for those two values. Okay? So let's go ahead and actually start working on some stuff. So the first chapter, or excuse me, the first section uh, is going to tell you about simplifying. Well, how do you simplify a normal fraction? Like, what if I asked you guys to simplify 4 over 8? What would that simplify to? 2 over 4. And keep going, right? And that would reduce to 1 half, right? You find those common factors. And so you realize that this is 2 and 2 and 2 and 4, and you're like, oh, they both have a 2. So that's why it reduces to 2 and 4 and so forth, right? Well, that's actually what we're going to do on these, except for they're not just normal numbers. They're just, we're just going to have to factor them. So just like we did in Chapter 13, we're just going to factor, but we're going to have to factor twice, once on top, once on bottom, okay? So let's look at these. The first one, there's nothing to factor. 2x squared is going to say 2x squared. But how can we factor the bottom. So let's rewrite this as 2x squared on top. And guys, let's look at the bottom. What's the number one rule in factoring? You need to look for what first? A common factor, okay? So looking at the bottom, what do 10 and 2 have in common? A 2, and then they also have what? An x squared, even, right? So we're going to factor that out. But remember, when you factor it out, pull it out in front and then state what's left, all right? So it was a 10, but we divided out a 2, so what's left? 5x. And then on the back half, how do we show that the 2x squared was there at one point? A 1. Does everybody see what I did? All I did was just basically give you a problem that you had in Chapter 13 and ask you to factor it, okay? But at that point, do you realize that we have a 2x squared over a 2x squared? We don't know what x is, but they match perfectly just like these two twos match perfectly. Any number over itself just reduces to one. So what we can do, guys, is we can cross those out. What do we need on top, though, to show that the numerator is still there? Well, when we cross them out, technically a one remains, okay? So we'll cross it out and there will be a one. So we'll have one on top and then 5x minus one on bottom. And that is the simplified form. That's it. So basically, you're going to factor twice, once on top, once on bottom, and then cancel, okay? And what we've done, Anna, is basically say that was like 4 eighths, we reduced it, reduced it to 1 half, okay? It's the same exact fraction, it's just now it's simplified. All right, so look at this bad boy. Guys, there's going to be a lot of like um, wand waving because we don't have a whole lot of time to focus on the factoring part. When you're working on your worksheet, you can, okay? So on this one, we have to factor it. So you would do 9 and 4, right? You do the AC method. What are factors of 36 that add up to 13? Yeah, I think Colin, you said it. Or I thought, or you're just talking about it. 9 and 4, right? Because 9 and 4 multiply to be 36, but what do 9 and 4 add up to? 13. So you would use the AC method here, okay? We're not going to do it. I'm just going to save time if that's okay. This factors to 9x plus 4 times x plus 1, okay? So we would use the AC method. We'd have to do that regrouping, right? We'd write it as 9x squared plus 9x plus 4x plus 4, and we would do the factor by grouping, all right? On the bottom, same exact thing. Factors of negative 56 that add up to a positive 1. The ones that got us to negative 66, 8 and negative 7, right? 8 and negative 7, what do they multiply to? Negative 56, but what's 8 plus a negative 7? That 1, okay? So again, we would rewrite it and we would do factor by grouping. What it would factor to is 8x minus 7 times x plus 1. And what do you guys see once we write them both in factored form? Yes. We don't know what x is, but say x was a 2. 
that would be a three on the back, and that would be a three on the back and the bottom. It'd be the same number, number over itself, right? So since we have a common factor on top and on bottom, they have to be on different levels, okay? They're going to factor cancel out. So this is 9x plus 4 over 8x minus 7. Over here, they're trying to kind of trip you up. We have 2 plus x over x plus 2. How can we rewrite 2 plus x? How can we change the order there? What, what could we write it as? Can't we just switch how the order is because they're both positive, right? So x plus 2 would be on top and x plus 2 would be on the bottom. What do you notice there? They cancel. So what would they cancel to? A one. Exactly. And I'm glad you said one because a lot of us want to say zero, like everything disappears. No, four over four reduces to one. Any number over itself reduces to one. Is that okay so far? On the next one, I'm going like, to pull this up just so I can zoom out. On the next one, let's try to do the same thing. Let's try to rearrange it, but make sure the signs go with them. So notice this one is a positive 2, and that one's a negative x, okay? So when I rearrange it, this is going to be a negative x plus 2 on top, right? A negative x plus 2 on top, and then we still have x minus 2 on the bottom. Okay? They almost match. They almost match. But what can we factor out of the top? Let's factor out a negative 1 and see what happens. Okay? What happens when you take a negative out of a negative? It turns positive. And what happens when you take a, a negative out of a positive? It turns negative. So when we factored out that negative 1, and you don't have to put the new one. Having a negative out in front like that's fine. When you factored out that negative 1, it turned the numerator into the denominator, okay? So when we cancel them, what remains? Negative 1, right? Because that negative 1 is still remaining there. Do you have to do all that work every time? No. You guys are going to get familiar that when you see two of the same thing, but the orders just flip-flop, like the signs are opposite, when they cancel, instead of canceling to be a 1, they just cancel to be a negative 1. It's called it. They differ by a sign. They differ by a sign, right? The 2 is positive here. The 2 is negative there. They differ by a sign. The x is negative here. The x is positive. By, so you'll get comfortable with that. All right, let's go ahead and um, factor this guy. The number one rule in factoring is to take out a GCF. What can we take out of 18 and 2? A 2, and that's it, right? So let's start with that. So we have 2. When we take a 2 out, remember we're dividing by 2, so what remains? And what's 18 divided by 2? 9. Then we took the 2 away, so the x squared still remains. Is that okay? And again, if you question it, you can just distribute it back in and check that it matches. On the bottom, guys, we're going to have to do the AC method. What are factors of negative 3 that add up to negative 2? Well, 3 is nice. Whenever you get a prime, you know it's factors of 3 and 1, right? So it'll be negative 3 and positive 1. So here's my wand waving. Poof! I'm using the AC method, and it factors to x minus 3, x plus 1 so far. And you look at that, you're like, okay, I factored both the top and bottom, but nothing's canceling out yet. What do you notice about this guy up here? What is he? He's not completely factored. He's a difference of squares, right? What's the square root of 9? Say it louder. 3, Three right? What's the square root of x squared? x. So we can actually factor this one more time, okay? The 2 will hang out in front. And remember I call it kind of like the open arms parentheses here. The 2 will hang out in front. Don't switch the order or anything. 9's in front, so the square root of 9 will go in front. So we'll have 3 in front, x in back, and opposite signs, right? Is that okay for the top there, guys? 2 times 3 plus x and 3 minus x? And then on the bottom,
bottom, it was already factored. X minus 3, X plus 1. All right, you look at that and you're like, they almost match. This is what we just had over here, right? This is X minus 3 and this is 3 minus X. They're just flip-flopped in order. So what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to cancel them. But when we cancel them, we're going to put a negative 1 up top, okay? So when we cancel them, a negative 1 remains. Do you guys see what I'm talking about? Like, they're just opposite signs there. All right, so the final answer, what you do when you have your final answer is you multiply everything that remains. You don't need a distributor or anything. So you have 2 times 3 plus x times negative 1. Well, what's that negative 1 do? It just makes the whole thing negative. So your answer is just negative 2 times 3 plus x all over x plus 1. That difference of signs when you cancel them out, guys, just makes your answer negative. That's all it does. Okay? So like the second you cancel those out, you might put a negative in my math lab, just to remind yourself. Does the negative have to go up top? No, it can go in front, it can go up top, it can go on the bottom, it doesn't matter. Alright. Real quickly, this guy, you're like, there's no GCF, we can't use the AC method. This is the sum of two cubes. Sum of two cubes. So that's that special formula that I give to you. We have to write it on the board, okay? So again, I will just reference what we need to do. That's in section 13.5 or our notes if you need to refer to it. But here's my wand waving going on, okay? This is going to factor to x plus 2 times x squared plus 2, excuse me, minus 2x. x squared minus 2x plus 4. over 2 plus x. x plus 2 x plus 2 times x squared minus 2x plus 4. The formula is always then singularly, so what's the cube root of x cubed? x. What's the cube root of 8? 2. So then singularly and then squared squared and the product. Alright? What can we cancel out? Yes. Do we need to put a minus 1 there? Yes or no? The order is flip-flopped, but are the signs flip-flopped? No. Okay, so be careful of that. This order was flip-flopped, but so were the signs, so that's why we had to put that negative 1 there. This order is flip-flopped, but couldn't we rewrite that as x plus 2, right? So when we cancel them, we don't need to put a negative there. They are the same. That is an x plus 2 on the bottom. So our final answer is x squared minus 2x plus 4. We don't usually put over 1. You don't say I'm 18 over 1 years old, right? So if the denominator disappears, that's okay. If the numerator disappears, you need to put a 1 there to show that, hey, the, what remains is on the denominator. All right, last one here, guys. We are just going to do a GCS on top and factor by grouping on the bottom, okay? So let's look at the top. What can we factor out of the top? What's the only thing that can come out? Two. A two. So go ahead and pull him out. When you factor out that two, what's going to remain? Y squared plus one. You got it. Y squared plus one. All right. I'm going to leave room for my answer, but I'm actually going to kind of work it out over here if you guys are okay with that. Whenever you have four terms, that's when you do factor by grouping, so you like look at the first two terms. What can you pull out of y cubed and side y squared? like y squared, yep, 2y. So we're going to do y squared, we're going to factor him out. That y cubed would go to a y, and then that minus 5 y squared would just go to minus 5. Is that okay? Alright, this is kind of weird. We didn't see a whole lot of these before. We want a y minus 5 to remain in back, but technically we still want to factor out something. So, yeah, exactly. What we want is there, so we're going to just factor out a 1. So what is this final factor form? The 2 came out on top to leave us y squared plus 1, but on the bottom, what's going to come out? y minus 5, but then what's going to remain? y squared plus 1. You guys see that? So just factor by grouping. Once you have those factored and you see those common factors that match, 
Cancel them out. So what's our remaining answer going to be? You got it. 2 over y minus 5. 